A uniform disk of mass M and radius R oscillates as a compound pendulum about a horizontal axis perpendicular to its plane through a point O on its circumference. Find a period of small oscillations. So to do that we first get the moment of inertia of the uniform disk about its center of mass. Now since it's un uniform its center of mass would be the geometrical center of the disk. So we'll call this point C. By the way this hole is for part uh, two of the question so for now pretend that this hole doesn't exist so we have a uniform disk. For a uniform disk the moment of inertia about the center is half the mass of the disk times the radius of the disk squared. Now we want the moment of inertia of the disk about the point O so we use the parallel axis theorem okay so the axis through the center of mass is parallel to, to the axis through the point O it's into the screen. So the parallel axis theorem tells us that the moment of inertia about the point O is equal to the moment of inertia about the center of mass of the disk plus the mass of the disk multiplied by the distance squared of the center of mass to the point O. So that distance is R, so we square it. So we have a half mR squared plus one mR squared, that's three halves mR squared. Now in a previous video, we saw the formula for the periodic time of a compound pendulum undergoing small oscillations. That is where theta is less than five degrees. Actually, theta is measured in radians, but in degrees, theta has to be less than five degrees for this formula to be a good approximation to the period. Okay, so that's what's meant by small oscillations. Um, okay, so I is the moment of inertia, which we have. M is the mass. H is the distance between the center of mass and the axis of rotation. So in this case, h is equal to r. So the m's cancel, one of the r's cancels, so we get um, 3 halves r over g, multiply above and below by 2, to get 3 r over 2 g. Now in part 2, we have a hole drilled in the center of the disc, and uh, this hole has the same center as the disc the overall disk, and its mass is 0.2 of the total mass of the disk. So let's get the period of oscillation of this new object. Now this new object is, we could say, is ring-shaped. So we want the moment of inertia of this ring. So let's start by getting the moment of inertia of the ring about the point C and from that we can use the parallel axis theorem to get the moment of inertia about the point O. Well, when we calculate moments of inertia we're getting sums of these quantities. Well, more accurately these are mass elements and uh, we take an integral, you know, when we let delta mi approach zero. So we're just summing these quantities for all the particles that make up our object. So if we want the moment of inertia of the ring, we could just take the moment of inertia of the entire disk from the first part, which is this here, and subtract off the moment of inertia of this piece in here. Okay, so we wouldn't be calculating these sums for the piece in here. So we get the moment of inertia of the whole lot by calculating all these sums and just um, not include these ones, not include the moment of inertia of the uniform disk or the uniform this that um, is responsible for that hole. Okay, so, right, so let's look at the overall disk. Well, we know what that is. That's a half mr squared from the first part. Now, the hole is in the shape of a uniform disk, so the uniform disk that occupied that hole had a mass of 0.2m. So it's the same formula, half the mass times the radius squared. Let's call the radius of this hole A. Now we want to get A in terms of R, the given radius. Now the way to do that is to relate the area of this hole to the mass. So for this object, since it's uniform, its thickness is uniform, and the mass is uniformly spread out through this area, the mass is proportional to the area. So if we double the area, if we say we take this amount of area, it has a certain mass. Suppose we take 
twice that area. Well then, the mass of the new area will be twice. So the mass is proportional to the area. So the area of, well the mass of this, of the piece that was removed is 0.2m. So the ratio of the mass of the inner piece to the total mass, m, is going to equal the area of the inner piece, it's a circle so it's pi a squared, to the area of the total, which is pi r squared. So again this is only true when the mass is proportional to the area. So from this we can get a in terms of r. Well actually we just need a squared here, so a squared is uh, 0.2 times r squared. So we end up at 0.48 mr squared. Notice that this value is actually close to the moment of inertia of the original disk about the centre. So taking out that piece whose mass is actually uh, one-fifth of the total mass does not decrease the moment of inertia by one-fifth. It only decreased it by 0 0.02. It went from 0 0.5 down to 0.48 it didn't make much of a difference actually. But again that's because the moment of inertia involves the distance squared of each mass element from the centre. So it's not just a question of, of the actual total mass of this piece but how spread out it is from the centre. It's very close to the centre so the moment of inertia of this piece is, was very small. It's only 0 0.02 mr squared. Now we're interested in oscillations of this ring about the point O. So for our formula we need the moment of inertia of the compound pendulum about the point O. So we use the parallel axis theorem. So um, the moment of inertia about the point O is the moment of inertia about the point C plus the mass of the compound pendulum. Well, what is the mass? Well if point 2m is removed, point 8m is left and uh, we multiply the mass by the distance of the centre of mass to point of oscillation O and that's just R. We, we square that distance. Okay so that's the, this part here, its mass is 0.8m. Okay so that's the moment of inertia about the point O, 1.28 mr squared. Now we can get t nu, so using this formula 2 pi times the square root of the moment of inertia of our compound pendulum is 1.28 mr squared. Now what about the mass? Well the mass of this compound pendulum is 0.8m because we removed 0.2m. So we have 0.8m uh, g and h is the distance between the centre of mass and the point O which is r of course. Okay 1 to 8 divided by 8 is 16 so what we get here is 1.6 on top um, and we have r and cancel the M's, we've just, we end up with this. So uh, we're told that T nu is 4 over root K times T old, where K is some number that we have to determine. So T nu divided by T old is this quantity here. Okay, so uh, we take the root sign over the whole lot, so we just have a single root sign over this fraction over this fraction. Uh, divide above and below by r, multiply above and below by g. Okay, so we have 1.6 uh, divided by 3 halves, which is 1.6 times 2 thirds. Um, somehow we have got to get that into the form 4 over root k. Um, we can break this into root 1.6 by root 2 thirds. Root 1.6 is... Um, well actually we'll take 16 out of this. Okay, I'll factorise 16 out of what's inside. So just to be clear, I'll just uh, write this as 16 by 10. Uh, sorry, not by 10, but by 0 0.1. Or 1 tenth by 2 thirds. You see, because we can, if it's square root of 16 is 4, I just want to get this 4. Um, so we'll have root 16 by the square root of the rest of it. That's 4 times root 2 over root 30. Okay, we can write that as 4 over root 30 over 2 or root 15. Of course, uh, you know, we don't have to do all this tricking around, that's not really that important. 
um, you know, uh, once you get down to this point here, root uh, 1.6 by 2 thirds, you could just set it equal to 4 over root k and solve. Alright, so this is the increase. Now 4 over root 15, that's a number that's greater than 1. So in other words, um, uh, t nu is actually greater than t old, okay? If we divide t nu by t old, we get a number that's bigger than 1. Um, so removing the mass, removing this disk from the center has increased the period. So, uh, that, well, that increase means it takes longer for the thing to oscillate back and forth. Okay. Um, look at, if we look at the formula for the period here, we can see that m appears in the denominator. So it looks like that if we take m and decrease it, that's what we did by removing this piece here, we decrease them. It looks like t goes up. But you see the problem is that i, if we decrease m, i also decreases. The moment of inertia also decreases, but obviously by not as much. Okay, see i, in, I involves the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia involves the mass. Um, so if we decrease m, we also decrease i, but obviously we don't decrease i by as much. So overall, um, t does indeed go up. When we decrease the mass, the periodic time increases. Well, at least in this situation, it's true. A uniform circular lamina of mass 8m and radius r can turn freely about a horizontal axis through the point P, perpendicular to the plane of the lamina. Particles each of mass m are fixed at four points which are on the circumference of the lamina, which are the vertices of the square PQRS. The compound body is set in motion. So we want to get the period of small oscillations of this compound pendulum. So we need the moment of inertia of this compound pendulum about the point P. Let's take each of the four particles. Well, the, mo the, mo the moment of inertia of the particle at point P about the point P is zero because its distance to itself is zero. Okay, so we need the distances to the point P. Let's take this mass here. So what do we need to do? We need it's just a particle at this point. Its moment of inertia about the point P is its mass, which is m, times the square of its distance from m. So we need to get the distance of q, sorry, the, the square of its the distance of q to P. So this is our, uh, this is actually a right angle triangle because the PQRS is a square. So we use Pythagoras to get this distance in terms of r. So we we square these two sides and sum them to get 2r squared. Take the square root to get root 2r. So we have to multiply this mass by root 2r squared. Well, that's just going to give us 2r squared. Okay, now let's move on to this one here. We multiply the mass by the square of its distance to p. That's r plus r. That's 2r squared. And finally, the situation for s is the same as for q. So we get the point mass at s multiplied by the square of its distance. Well, that's um, distance is root 2r, so the distance squared is 2r squared. Okay, so these are the moments of inertia for point particles. Now, what about a disk? Well, that's a more complicated story. We want the moment of inertia of the disk about the point p. So what we do is consider the moment of inertia of the disk about the center. Well, we know from the previous video and other videos that it's half the mass. The mass is 8m. It's a uniform circular lamina times um, the uh, distance to the axis squared. That's r squared. So it's the moment of inertia about the point C plus the mass of the lamina times the square of the distance of the center of mass to the point P. Okay, so I'm here I'm just using the parallel axis theorem. So this here is the moment of inertia of the disk about the center of mass. Now the center of mass is the geometrical center here because everything is symmetric plus the mass times the distance squared. Okay, so this will give us the moment of inertia of the disk about the point P.
okay where the mass of the disk is 8m and uh, the distance between um, the center of mass an axis at the center of mass and an axis through p is is r adding up all of these you get 20 m r squared we need the total mass well that's straightforward so the mass of the disk is 8 m and uh, we have four point masses that's 4 m so here's the formula that we saw um, before and we derived actually so just plug everything in here 20 m r squared on top the total mass is 12 m times g now h is the distance between the center of mass and the axis of rotation so that distance is r so simplifying down we get this quantity and that's in seconds of course because it's the periodic time now as a brief aside i'll just mention the units of this thing here so what are the units of i well remember i is the sum of quantities of the form m r squared mass times distance squared so mass is in kilograms distance is in meters and we want to square those distances so we get meters squared underneath we have mass well mass is in kilograms we have g which is uh, an acceleration g is meters per second squared and what about h h is the a distance it's in meters so all these units should break down to units of time seconds so that's one way to see that your formula is correct so what do we get here well we get 2 pi which is no units it's just a constant on top we have 1 over s to the power of minus 2 well that's s to the power of 2 so we can see that the units do indeed come out to be seconds we can forget about this that's just a factor with no um, dimensions in the next part we're going to get the length of the equivalent simple pendulum well we've seen before that the period of a simple pendulum depends on the length l of the pendulum it also depends on the acceleration due to earth's gravity well we, we are only going to look at pendulums near the surface of the earth not near the surface of some other planet so but the main thing to notice is that the periodic time doesn't depend on the mass so we want this to equal what we got for the compound pendulum and we want to determine what the length L has to be and it doesn't actually matter what mass we attach to this uh, length L any mass will do and this simple pendulum will have the same period as our compound pendulum so we just solve this equation for L so we get L equals 5 thirds R so we can have a simple pendulum with any mass whatsoever here as long as we make the length equal to 5 thirds the radius of um, this uh, compound pendulum the radius of the circle that makes up this compound pendulum a uniform rod of mass 3m and length 1.2 meters can turn freely in a vertical plane about a horizontal axis through one end the rod oscillates through an angle of 120 degrees uh, we want to get the angular velocity of the rod when the rod is vertical we know from previous videos that we can apply conservation of energy uh, to this compound pendulum so let's suppose that the rod is at rest in this position so its initial kinetic energy will be zero okay it's released from rest what about its initial potential energy okay so we proved in earlier videos that the potential energy of a rigid body is the same as the potential energy of a point particle whose mass is equal to the mass of the rigid body located at the center of mass okay so we need to take a reference level well um, the most convenient reference level to take here in this problem is the position of the center of mass when the rod is vertical okay so that would be the lowest position of the center of mass
Okay, so the rod's mass is 3m. So we want to get its height above this reference level. Okay, so let's do the trigonometry. So um, the potential energy is the mass, which is 3m, the mass of the rod, which is modeled as a pint particle of mass 3m, times g times the height above the reference level. So that's this little, little h here. So how do we find that height? Well, um, this distance is 0.6, so let's just indicate some values here. So just drawing this right angle triangle, so we can calculate this distance here quite easily. It's the side adjacent to 60 in this right angle triangle. So the hypotenuse is 0.6 multiplied by the cos of 60 to get the side adjacent to 60. Uh, what do we do then? Well, we take the total distance from here to here, which is 0.6, half the length of the rod, and subtract um, this quantity here. So we can see that h, h is um, total distance 0.6 minus this green distance here, which is 0.6 cos 60. The cos of 60 is a half, so we have 0.6 minus 0.3, which is 0.3. Now let's consider the final energy of the rod when it's in the vertical position. So we need its kinetic energy. Well, we proved in an earlier video that the kinetic energy of a rotating rigid body is a half i omega squared, where omega is the angular speed at that instant. So uh, omega would be the angular speed when the rod is vertical. i is the moment of inertia of the rod about the axis of rotation. So the axis of rotation is perpendicular to the screen at this point here. We have to add to this the potential energy. Well, we can see that the center of mass is on the reference level, so the height is zero, so the potential energy is zero. So we have a situation here where the initial energy is all kinetic energy, and it's converted into Sorry, it's all potential energy, and it's connected into kinetic energy. So all the potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. Okay, so let's calculate I for the rod, the moment of inertia. Well, um, if you know the moment of inertia of a rod about an axis through the center of mass, a uniform rod um, about an axis through the center of mass, you can use the parallel axis theorem to get it about one end, or you can just calculate it for one end. But I'll use the fact that um, the moment of inertia of a rod uh, about an axis through the center is one third times the mass of the rod, which is 3m in this case, times half the length squared. Well, the length is 1.2, so half the length is 0.6. Okay, so this is the formula one third ml squared, where the rod has mass m and the length is 2L. So just taking half of the length to get L, half of 1.2 is 0.6, and the mass of this particular rod is 3M. Okay, and so that's the moment of inertia about the center of mass. Um, you know, we could call this IC, and we want to add onto it the mass of the rod times the distance from the center of mass to the axis of rotation squared. Well, the mass of the rod is 3m, and that distance is 0.6 squared. Okay, so that's the final energy. The kinetic en uh, the potential is zero. Um, uh, we have the omega squared, of course, that we have to determine. The angular speed at the instant the rod is vertical. So this must equal this quantity here, which is 0.9mg. Okay, you'll find from this equation that omega is 3.5 radians per second. Now, for part two, we're going to consider the forces acting on the rod. So, let's start when the rod is in this position here. Well, the weight of the rod is vertically down, 3mg, so that force vector never changes, it's always constant. Now. There's obviously a force acting on the rod to keep it in this position, otherwise it would just fall to the ground. So that's the thrust force on the rod, um, which is acting at point O, actually. But in what direction does it act? 
Well, it, as a matter of fact, it keeps changing direction. And the reason I know that is because the resultant force keeps changing direction. So how do we know that the resultant force keeps changing direction? Well, we're dealing with non-uniform circular motion. If we were dealing with uniform circular motion, if the rod was moving with constant angular speed omega as it, um, as it moved, well, we know from this, the section on circular motion that the resultant force would be the centripetal force, force directed towards the center of rotation. So no matter where the rod is, the resultant force would point towards O. And we know what the magnitude is from that section. It's given by the mass of the rod, well M in general, but in this case the mass is 3M, so we put 3M in for M. R is 0.6 and omega would be, would be a constant. Okay, we know that from the section on circular motion. But that's uniform circular motion. We're dealing with non-uniform circular motion here. But again, it doesn't actually matter um, because we're only going to look at the component of the resultant force F along the rod. And we proved in a video, an earlier video in the circular motion section, that that component of the resultant force is given by this quantity here, just like as if we were dealing with the case of uniform circular motion. Um, so let's consider the rod when it's in this position here. Well, we know that the rod stops momentarily in this position, or it was released from this position. Of course, it goes over and comes back and stops. So if it stops, omega is zero. And if omega is zero, well, um, the component of the resultant force along the rod is zero. So actually, we don't have that, that black vector pointing towards O, because because the component along the rod is zero in this position, the resultant force vector would actually point in this direction, point in a direction that's perpendicular to the rod. Okay, um, that's that position. That's the situation when the rod is at that position. Now let's take some intermediate position. Let's say the center of mass is here. Okay, I could draw in the rod. Well, Again, the weight vector is always constant, it's pointing vertically down, has magnitude 3mg. Now, the resultant force would actually point not towards O, but below O, for the situation of a particle that's uh, speeding up. Okay, so the rod is speeding up as it moves from this position to this new position. So this would be the resultant force vector F. Um, now, what happens when it gets to here? Well, when it gets to here, things switch over, actually, because when the rod passes through the vertical position, the rod slows down. So when the rod is on the way up again, the resultant force is actually pointing in this direction. Okay, just again, it's pointing underneath O. It's not pointing towards O. So in the position when the rod is vertical, the resultant force is actually pointing towards O. But even if we don't know that fact, it, do, it doesn't matter, because we're only interested in the component of the resultant force along the rod. Okay, so this is the resultant force F. Now, what makes up this resultant force? Well, it comes from the weight, obviously, 3mg, and it also comes from the truss force on the rod. So I'll indicate that truss force in blue. So when the rod is at a vertical position, the truss force is actually vertically up. But when the rod is in other positions, the truss force is pointing in other directions because the resultant force is pointing in other directions. So when the rod is vertical, the resultant force is this truss force, which I'm calling T, which is pointing up. I take upwards as positive. And then you add on this weight force. Well, that force is negative because it's down. Okay, so this is the situation when the rod is in the vertical position. Now, if the rod was not in the vertical position, all we could do is just, what we could do is just emphasize the, um, well, I won't say V, but the component along the rod, I'll say R for rod. The component of the resultant force along the rod would be the component of the truss force along the rod minus, actually, this t we'd have to get the component of this thing, the weight along the rod as well. Okay, so I'd have 3mg times, say, cos of whatever this angle is. Okay, so this would be our theta. So that'd be the more general situation, but 
we just have the simpler situation here. It turns out that the resultant force is pointing towards O, which means the thrust must be pointing upwards as well because that's the only way um, the resultant force is going to be pointing upwards. Okay, since the weight is vertically down. So at this instant, the resultant force is centripetal. It is pointing towards O, but in general it's not. In general, we would have to take the component along the rod, and then we could only consider the component of the truss force along the rod. Now, again, um, you know, if we don't, you don't have to know about the direction of the resultant force for this non-uniform circular motion thing. You know, um, you don't have to know that it's pointing along the rod. I mean, for all you know, that the resultant force could be pointing like this. Again, we're just interested in the component along the rod, and the component is is what counts. So, if we thought the force is pointing along this direction, we would just put V here for the vertical component of F, and of course, T then would not point along the rod either. If F doesn't point along the rod, T would would have to point along some other direction, so that when we add T onto 3mg, we get this force. So T would be pointing something like this. So the sum of T and 3mg would give us F. Again, we'd only be interested in the vertical component, so we could just put V here. So we could still answer the problem, because um, what is emphasized here is the vertical thrust. So if T has a horizontal component, we're only interested in the vertical component. Okay, but um, anyway... I'll just go back to what's actually going on. F does indeed point up when the rod is in this position. So we just have to set this thing equal to mr squared w, or omega. So um, m is, well, the mass of is 3m. So we've point six squared for r. And omega is the angular speed when the rod is in the vertical position. Um, that's equal to t minus 3mg. So we just have to rearrange this thing to get t. Omega we know actually. So we just get t in terms of m. 